Here we go. It's all good. There we go. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Bartlett, the head librarian of the Society Library, and it's uh, great to have a full house uh, out tonight for uh, an evening, a lecture by Janet Wallach, and a book signing as well. I'm really happy to report to all of our library members that our annual fund last year was very successful and your contributions have had an impact on many areas of the library. Uh, it supports our reading rooms, like the members room you're in, our research collection, our book seminars, our technology classes, our children's library, and just about everything that happens in the library, and particularly the evenings like tonight. Thank you all. Before we begin, uh, let me ask everyone who has a cell phone to perhaps uh, take it out and turn it off so it doesn't ring during the uh, presentation or the question and answer. Tonight I am so pleased to welcome Janet Wallach, a good friend of the library and the author of this uh, wonderful new book, The Richest Woman in America, Hetty Green in the World of Age. Her latest book is well-researched and compassionate, port a well-researched and compassionate portrait of Hetty Green I had the pleasure of reading it last month, and I have to tell you, uh, Ms. Wallach, that it's often when I stand up here, I, I'm confessing to uh, presenters that I haven't finished the book by the time I'm introducing them, but I really, really enjoyed this one. The famous financer Green, who died in 1916, was, as many of you know, worth at least $100 million, equal to more than $2 billion in today's currency. <coughs> Many people really disliked Teddy Green. Many people also admired her. But what's certain is that she will always remain a very important person in American finance <coughs> history. And in our library, the Society Library, she also plays a part, and many of you may not know this, because her daughter, Sylvia Green Wilkes, left a good portion of her estate to this institution we were just looking through the archives again in the last few days to verify the facts. And in 1953, the library had received over $600,000 from the estate of Sylvia Wilkes. And that was from a uh, $150 million estate. We were one of many recipients of money from the estate, but an important part of our history. Our friends from the Corner Bookstore are here with us tonight in the Peluso Gallery and they're very happy to sell you a copy of the book and we'll have a signing after. Let me tell you a little bit more about Ms. Wallach. She's the author of nine books and has written extensively about the Middle East. Her book, Desert Queen, The Extraordinary Life of Gertrude Bell, has been translated into 12 languages and was a New York Times notable book of the year. She was a frequent contributor to the Washington Post magazine from 1982 to 87 and contributes to Smithsonian Magazine and other periodicals. She's currently a Woodrow Wilson Institute Visiting Fellow, and she's appeared as a guest commentator on various TV programs for CNN, a &E Biography, and SNBC, and uh, other venues on television. She also co-hosted a nationally syndicated program, Private Lives, Public People, on the Lifetime Cable Network. Please join me now in a warm welcome to Janet Wallach. background uh, about how I, how I came to write this book. It was around 2006, and I was searching for a subject for, the, for my next book, and a friend said, Janet, I think I've got the right woman. She said, uh, this is a woman who was part of the Gilded Age and uh, eccentric, and brilliant, a financial genius, and uh, very well known in her time. I said, really, what's her name? And she said, Hetty Green. I said, Hetty who? 
I had certainly never heard of Hetty Green, but I thought, okay, it's worth some research. And so I did some reading about Hetty Green and it sounded interesting, although I've written about foreign affairs and I've written about fashion. I have never written about finance. Uh, and so it, it did seem a little uh, off <laughs> my, my course. But it was interesting because she was so successful and we were living in times that were so successful, 2006, 2007, everything was just uh, bursting with joy and wealth and so on. And then came 2008 and the bubble burst and I thought, gee, the stock market is crashing and the real estate market is collapsing. And that's exactly what Hetty Green lived through, not once, not twice, but several times. And she not only survived it, she came out on top. So this might be kind of interesting to find out how she did it. You know, how was she so successful? So I did some more research, and of course a biographer's hope, dream, is that there will be diaries, journals, something like that. There were no diaries to be found. And then I came across something that Tallulah Bankhead said, which was, good girls keep diaries, bad girls don't have time. <laughs> and I thought about Eddie Grant, I thought, well, she, it wasn't that she, didn't ha that, that she was busy with men. Hetty Green was so busy making money, but that's who she was. Money was her, was her life, money was her passion, and it was also the, the passion of her family. She was born Hetty Howland Robinson in 1834 in New Bedford to a whaling family, and of course whaling was a major industry of the time. All the houses and factories were fueled by whale oil, not just in New Bedford or New England or America, but all around the world. And her family was um, one of the most prosperous in the town, and the town was the most prosperous in America. And they really were kind of, from the outside at least, a model family. They were hardworking, they were very successful, they had good values, uh, they, they, had, they were spiritual, they were outstanding citizens. Her father was an early supporter of Abraham Lincoln. And they had the New England values of thrift to the point of being uh, stingy, frankly. <laughs> Particularly her father and then later Penn. They were Quakers who believed in simplicity, in simple living, uh, and in, in, in plain clothes as the Quakers wore in those days. And they believed that wealth was a sign of virtue, and they were certainly blessed. Her father's only hope was that they would be a son. And lo and behold, when um, Mrs. Uh, uh, Robinson was with child, he, her, he was very excited, Edward Mott Robinson, but to his great disappointment, his firstborn was a girl whom they named Hetty. And she remained the only child in the family, the only heir to the family money. But Edward Mott Robinson was so upset that his child was a girl that he literally dismissed her from the house. His anger was so great that his wife took to her bed, <coughs> rarely came out again, and Hetty before she was two years old, was sent to live with her grandfather and her spinster aunt. And of course, what she wanted so badly was to have her father's love. And she learned early <coughs> on that to have it, she would have to earn it. Money was everything. And her grandfather, too, was very interested in money, not quite the way her father was, um, but he was a partner in the business of Isaac Howland and, and Sons the whaling business, and very early on, when Hetty learned to read, her grandfather would snap open the newspapers, he had poor eyesight, and so he would ask this little girl to read him the business news, 
and the stock market reports and the commodities report, all of which he was very involved with. And it was all so important to this family that when Hetty was eight years old, she took her savings and uh, went downtown and opened her own savings account, which was considered a, an act of great merit by the family. And there was a, a dichotomy in the family. On the one hand, they wanted her to be a simple, to live a simple life, a Quaker life, uh, and for her to be unspoiled. On the other hand, she was the heiress to quite a lot of money, and they wanted her to marry well. So in the first instance, they sent her to a Quaker boarding school, where she learned to eat mush and read the Bible every day, again, wear simple clothes, and she learned compassion for the poorer girls who, in, the, in the boarding school. But then she was sent off to a finishing school in Boston, where she learned to uh, dress well. She became a striking young woman. She learned to dance and to play the piano and to become a good conversationalist. And she made her debut in 1854. And there was a third way that she learned, and that was with her father. She did become closer to him, and he taught her as much as he could about business. And he took her around to the docks and to the whaling vessels, and, and he showed her how to read the accounts. And so she really learned about business. And she learned that in order to invest money, she would have to study hard, know those businesses or those properties that she, that she might buy inside out and upside down, because that was the best way to invest, to be truly knowledgeable about what she was doing. Well, her first visit was her, to New York was her debut in 1854, and then came a return visit in 1860. And she had family here, um, the Howlands, who were well-known family in, in New York. Nothing could outdo the flurry of excitement that Hetty encountered when she returned to New York in 1860 the city shimmered with news that the Prince of Wales was coming to visit. In his honor, a group of leading citizens was organizing a ball. Society men trimmed their mustaches and clipped the hairs of their side whiskers. Women spent hours twisting their curls and preparing their toilet for the ball. At 9 p.m. that evening of Friday, October 12, 1860, Excited couples who had paid $10 a piece <laughs> arrived at the Academy of Music on Irving Place. Precisely at 10 p.m., the orchestra played God Save the Queen, and in marched the slight, small prince. <laughs> For two hours, nearly 3,000 of New York's finest citizens rushed like schoolgirls to meet him. And in the mad crush, the wooden floor built especially for the occasion collapsed. <laughs> Never mind, no one was hurt. While the bands played furiously, the prince and his court were led upstairs <coughs> and the guests rushed to follow. Livery waiters plied them with food. There were fillet of beef and lobster salad, pate, truffles and grouse, and glasses of <laughs> champagne. At 2 a.m., they finally fixed the dance floor, and strains of a Strauss quadrille could be heard. Mm -hmm. Eager females, young and old, waited their turn for a waltz or a polka. Finally, the young girl from New Bedford was tapped. She was stunning in her low-cut white gown, sashed with pink, her arms covered in long white gloves, and an ostrich feather fluttering in her hand. She was introduced to the Prince of Wales. And I am the Princess of Wales, she joined. <laughs> <laughs> ah, he was so charming, and he replied, I have heard that all of Neptune's daughters are beautiful, and you are proof of that. <laughs> and he sailed her away on the dance floor. <laughs> Well, it wasn't the prince who wound up courting her. It was a fellow named Edward Green, 
who was over six feet tall, over 200 pounds in weight, a self-made millionaire who had lived most of his adult life in Asia as a merchant trader dealing in everything <coughs> from silk to opium. Smart, clever, uh, a speculator, but a, pre a man who appreciated money. And when he asked for her father's approval, Edward Mont Robinson said yes. But there was one condition, a prenup, if you will. <laughs> they would have to live on Edward's money. Hetty's would be hers to protect, to invest and increase, and to pass on to the next generation, because that was the motto of the family, and that was the way that the Quakers generally thought. Protect it and pass it on to the next generation. Well, shortly after that, Hetty's father died, and he left her the money. But Hetty had thought that her father trusted her to invest. Instead, he put the money in trust $5 million and gave her $1 million that she could use for investment. Two weeks later, her spinster aunt died. And there had been an agreement between Hetty and her aunt that <coughs> Hetty thought was solid that said her aunt's money would go directly to Hetty. Instead, there was some later part of the will that Hetty was unaware of that said, that half of that money, a million dollars, would go to the city of New Bedford and to her aunt's friends. The other million dollars would go to Hetty, once again in trust. <laughs> Hetty was furious. And so she started a lawsuit, which became a landmark case and made Hetty litigious for life. <laughs> Fortunately, Edward stayed by her side and shortly after the lawsuit started, they married, and they moved to England. Edward sold American railroad bonds to European investors in London. Hetty bore two children and invested her own money in American railroad bonds and in greenbacks. And she did very well. She was proud to say later on, that in one day, one time, she made $250,000. And that's a lot of money. Even now, that's a lot of money. <laughs> but Europe was booming. Uh, banks were loaning easy money at low interest rates, and investors were borrowing from the European banks and buying American railroad bonds. In fact, they bought 80% of the bonds of American railroad. And in Europe, real estate was booming, skyrocketing. In fact, so much that it reached the point where nobody could afford it anymore. And so the real estate market collapsed. Uh, loans were called in. Europeans started selling their railroad bonds. And in addition, there was a discovery of enormous corruption in the railroad industry in America. And so people started selling their stocks and bonds here. A major American railroad collapsed. A bank that funded it <coughs> closed its doors. And not only in Europe, but in the US, the bubble <coughs> burst. It was then that Hetty and Edward <coughs> hacked up their two children and sailed on the, the ship Russia in early October 73, 1873, back to New York. The city had burgeoned in the boom years. 10-story buildings stood tall on the horizon, and Central Park stretched north as far as 80th Street. <laughs> Expensive brownstone houses replaced the shanties, and along Fifth Avenue, apartment houses appeared for the first time. Scribner's opened. St. Patrick's majestically touched the sky. The Metropolitan Museum opened on 14th Street. And the Museum of Natural History opened uptown. The exuberant spending that had once more infected New York was, as, was no different than the unfettered expansion 
led by industrial entrepreneurs, railroad promoters, and real estate speculators in the Midwest and the West. But by the autumn of 1873, when Hetty and Edward arrived, the financial panic had pricked the bubble of hope and flattened the country into despair. New York jittered as stocks went up and down. On Wall Street, men in frock coats, floppy ties, and silk hats, stunned by their losses, <coughs> moved in a daze. Only a few months before, they had walked briskly, the bands of their stovepipes bulging with commercial paper. Now, they held onto their tall hats and just shook their heads. Even lawyers found themselves unemployed. Shortly after Hetty arrived, she donned her dark dress and cloak and crammed her bag full of stocks and bonds and headed downtown. Past the granite building <coughs> of August Belmont, who represented the Rothschilds, past the, comp the, the uh, <coughs> customs house, and entered the offices of Joseph Sisko. He had been her father's banker, he was Edward's banker, and he was Teddy's banker now as well. And he made his services available for her business on Wall Street. At this time, when stocks were being abandoned, Hetty wanted to trade. I believe in getting in at the bottom and out at the top, she said. I like to buy railroad stocks or mortgage bonds, and when I see a good thing going cheap because nobody wants it, I buy it and tuck it away. For Hetty, the decline in the market offered an opportunity for the future. As prices declined and imports decreased, new opportunities opened up for innovative entrepreneurs. And yet, at the same time, businesses continued to decline. More than 5,000 companies closed their doors in 1873, more than 6,000 in 1874, and within one year, three million people lost their jobs. And it continued for almost 10 years. While this was going on, Hetty kept investing. And as she invested, her husband speculated. It was okay, except when he crossed the red line. <coughs> he used her money as collateral for bad risks. And the bank called headache. So she paid up on his mistakes, but she sent him packing. So by 1885, Hetty was a single working mother with two children. <coughs> Now, at the time, there were constant articles about women, how inferior women were, how inept they were with money, and how innately impossible it was for women to invest. And there were constant articles about Hetty. She was always in the newspapers. She was mean, they said. She was miserly, they said. And she was a terrible mother. Well, it was true. She was a Quaker. She watched her pennies. She lived in boarding houses or had small apartments, and she moved constantly because she didn't want to be considered a resident anywhere and have to pay taxes. <laughs> she dressed plainly. She ate simply. But she did teach her son and daughter about investing, and she believed firmly that young women should know everything they could about finance, about reading a bank statement and a business statement, and that at the very Worst, a young woman would be better for it as a wife, uh, or at the best, and at the worst, she might be able to have a career. So she believed, again, as I say, strongly that women should know about finance. Well, the truth was that Hetty's son loved finance, and when she gave him a small branch of a bankrupt railroad in Texas, he was able to turn it around and make it the most successful small railroad in the state. Her daughter was not so keen on all of that. And when uh, 
while Hetty spent a lot of time with Ned, her son, Sylvia was under the care, fortunately for her, of Hetty's friend Annie Leary, who was a socialite in New York, one of the few Catholics who was a socialite, and a great philanthropist. In fact, later on, she was made a papal countess because she was so generous to the church. Well, Hetty was a clever conversationalist <coughs> when she chose to be, but her daughter was too self-conscious to really speak up. And although many considered her intelligent, her sad countenance and dour disposition <coughs> made many regard her as Dr. Sloper in Henry James's Washington Square viewed his own offspring as he said, my daughter is a wealthy woman with a large fortune. She is about as intelligent as a bundle of shawls. <laughs> well, witty or not, Sylvia took part in Annie Leary's social world. And Annie introduced the 20-year-old Sylvie to her best friends and to their daughters and to their unmarried sons. And <coughs> Sylvie stepped timidly into a round of social events at which she was constantly on display and she was expected to flaunt her charms and attract a future husband. She attended the Patriots <coughs> Ball in January 1982, which dazzled the guests and the press with Delmonico's awash in pink roses and, and festoons of flowers around the chandeliers. Almost 150 guests were invited and they arrived after attending the Metropolitan Opera. They came at 11.30 p.m., danced for an hour, dined on duck and, and wine, and then again danced to two orchestras. At 3.30 a.m., the strains of Goodnight Ladies wafted through the air, and Sylvie joined the rest of the guests as they put on their wraps and faded away. She had endured her first Patriarch's Ball never again. <laughs> Still, there were the requisite dinners, for which an invitation, said Ward McAllister, is a social obligation. If you die before the dinner takes place, your executor must attend the party. <laughs> And so Sylvie so went to the dinners. And then Annie invited her to Newport, where Sylvie spent the month of August. And to Annie Leary's relief, one young man paid Sylvie attention, which was great until Hetty heard about it. And when she looked up at the young man, she told her daughter, if it wasn't for his father, the world wouldn't know a thing about that young man to come. <laughs> so, Sylvie went back to New York, Hetty went back to business, and while others might fritter away their time and money on the conspicuous consumption of the Gilded Age, Hetty had scores to sell and buildings to buy and railroads to run, and she did. And as much as she was buying up things, the country was booming until it went into another recession in 1893, and then boomed again, and then the bubble burst in 1907. One more time. And it began to sink, that balloon, that bubble, in the spring of 1907 with a stock market crash in Egypt, followed by a run on the banks, and then crashes and failures in Japan, in Germany, and Chile. Throughout the world, a hoarding panic seized the markets. But the phenomenal increase in America's economic strength and the great resources of its banks reassured everyone that the United States was safe. No similar fate for this country with few regulations to restrain them, U.S. banks continued to loan more and more, lowering their reserves at greater risk and greater risk of not having ready money if customers wished to call in their deposits. But they weren't worried 
It had been a cardinal doctrine in American banking circles that a panic like those before in 1893 <coughs> and 1873 would never again be witnessed in this country, wrote the financial editor of the New York Times. Well, in the fall, the Metropolitan Railway went under, and worse, the banks started getting in trouble, and the most risky were the trust company, institutions that invested money for beneficiaries of estates and wills. They had accepted demand deposits with little regulation and even less in cash reserves. They had traded in stocks, they had speculated in real estate, and they loaned money for risky mortgages. Well, you know what happened. <laughs> once again, once again. But there were confidence building measures that were put in place with the help of J.P. Morgan and business leaders and the Treasury Department, and the markets came back into shape. The crisis was over, but it offered valuable lessons for the future. Exaggerated expectations, wild speculation, and high leverage would lead to disaster. Never again. <laughs> Every time the boom came, it was done in by greed and by ego, by overlending and by overspending. And as Warren Buffett said recently, a climate of fear is an investor's best friend. Well, Hetty kept a cool head. She worked hard. She did her homework. She knew those companies and those properties inside out and upside down. And when everyone else panicked and jumped overboard, she climbed up and grabbed the oars. And when everybody else started climbing on board, she quietly clambered off. <laughs> it took courage to do it. But she bought when everyone else was selling, and she sold when everyone else was buying. And by the time she died in 1916, she had owned mortgages on 28 churches in Chicago. She owned houses and big blocks of office buildings and stretches of mines, and her properties extended from New York, to, from Maine to New York, to uh, Chicago and Illinois, all the way up to California. She helped out banks when they were in trouble, and she was the largest individual lender to New York City. When the city needed money, she bought the bonds, and she was always there for the city. She believed in, in investing in America, and she, she lived in a, the Gilded Age when society lived lavishly, but she lived the way she believed. She rebelled against their opulence. She believed in a simple life. She loved her children and her friends, and she loved her dog. And when somebody asked you, why do you love that dog so much, and show him so much affection, she said, because he doesn't know how rich I am. <laughs> <laughs> so she lived her life as she deemed best. She forged a path for women to have business careers and be mothers. And through her clever investing, she showed that women were the equal of any man. And as Mark said, when she died, she was worth over $100 million, which is worth over $2 billion today. And at her death, newspapers around the world wrote about her, proclaimed her the queen of Wall Street, and recognized that by her own doing, she became the richest woman in America. So I hope that you uh, enjoy her story and uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Is there anything interesting or notable about how she researched her investments prior to uh, Good hard work, you know, and, and she also was smart to, to be friendly with other people, always men, 
who were knowledgeable about business. And she had some very good friends who were, who were very smart investors <coughs> on Wall Street and, and around the country. Uh, and she listened to them carefully. They listened to her too. Uh, it, was a, it was both ways. But she really studied. I, you know, from early morning to late at night, she was doing research, reading the newspapers, reading reports, and they were, as, as complicated as reports are today, they were a whole lot harder then, because there was so, you know, well, the word transparency, I think, didn't exist in the, in the financial world. Yes? Um, what happened to the children? Uh, Ed, after, after Hetty died, married the woman he loved for many years, who she despised, his mother despised, but he finally married her. And, and had an interesting life. He did, he, was, he ran a very successful railroad in Texas. Uh, he built a huge house on their property up in Massachusetts. He was very interested in radio and technology and built a laboratory that was used by the US Navy during the war uh, and was used by the, um, by the pilots for meteor meteorology and um, the, all sorts of communication. He was a big collector. He had one of the most important stamp collections in the world, one of the most important uh, coin collections in the world. And I hate to say this, but I will. Also one of the most biggest pornography collections. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a charming man, and I spoke to somebody recently who knew him. And he, was the, he and his wife were lovely people, but they never had any children. Uh, the daughter married Matthew Astor Wilkes. She lived around the corner at 988 Fifth Avenue and in Greenwich, Connecticut. And when she died, a, a small amount of her money, $10,000, went to Robert Moses because she was so pleased that he built the parkway between New York and Greenwich. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and the what, what happened during the Civil War? They were in England at the yes, time. Yes, they yeah. were. Just went yeah. there during the yeah. war. Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah. But, but New Bedford really um, worked hard to support the soldiers, which is interesting because they had such a big Quaker population. But they did support the war and they supported Lincoln. Um, <clears throat> and but, and her, but her family were divided on the subject because they were New York merchants. And as you know, in New York, there was a big issue about whether to support the North, you know, or to the war, or to support the South because of trade. Yes. Was she at all philanthropic in her lifetime? I'm sorry to say that there are no records of her philanthropy. Her son said that she did help people. Uh, and I suspect that she did give money anonymously. She had two friends who were huge ph philanthropists. And uh, my, my instinct tells me that, that they did encourage her to give. But it was always anonymous because she was constantly getting letters. She was so well known. She was always being besieged for money. And she didn't want people to know who she was giving to or how much she was given. Yes? Um, is it true that she watched her child, I forgot which one, like get amputated? No, that is not true. That, that, that she was responsible for her son uh, son's leg being amputated. No, she cared a lot about him. She took him to doctors all over. Um, and did everything that she possibly could to save Ned's leg when it was um, when it when every doctor had said that amputation was the only way to take care of it. And she tried every method possible to save it. And I it is in the book. Yeah. Yes. The money that she was managing, this was obviously her own money, did she also invest, have some kind of a firm where she invested that money for clients, and if so, what kind of clients? She did it. She, it was all her own money. She didn't want to take responsibility for anybody else's money. Uh, so it was hers and her, you know, and the family. But I have the same question. I wondered if she had an office somewhere where she did all these Well, <laughs> she, she really was a character. She didn't want to have a proper office where that the tax people could say, prove that she was you know, established in New York. So she made, they made space for her at the, at the Cisco Bank and later at the Chemical Bank. 
and, and she did have a big space at the back of the bank, and she worked there, which was actually very convenient because then she had access to all of the people in the bank. And, um, but, yeah. Over here. So stupid question, but I thought I heard she carried yeah. something in her pocket. Did you ever hear anything about that? She Oh, well, it could have been anything from sandwiches, which she brought to work, um, or sometimes, I don't know, stocks and bonds, maybe. Um, you know, she just was, she had papers everywhere, and the desk was piled with papers and so on. Yes? So, uh, <clears throat> my uh, introduction to uh, Hetty was through her daughter, Sylvia, as I did a little research uh, on medical history. And Sylvia left our hospital um, over a million dollars in 1951 or so. It's about $10 million today. Um, <clears throat> our hospital is the oldest orthopedic hospital in New York City in the world, in the country, actually, even it's in New York City. And my question to you is, uh, it's interesting that, that Sylvia left a lot of money, philanthropy, to, to churches and schools and hospitals while her mother didn't, or at least it wasn't recorded that way in her obituary in the New York Times. <coughs> but but yeah, my question yeah. is, uh, I, do you know of other heirs from after this, from Sylvia and, uh, and the brother? Well, I do. And of course, the reason that Hetty didn't leave it in her will to all these other places was that she was taught from a young age, you protect it, you increase it, and you pass it on to your heirs. And so she did that, and then when Ned died, he passed it on to Sylvia. So Sylvia was the one who really distributed all of the money. Um, and in, so, so it was there, and it was to the New York Society Library, Wellesley College. There were you know, institutions all over the country that received money. And there were also 450-some-odd family members who received part of the estate. Uh, and in fact, I do know somebody who, who received some of that. And he is just sorry, he says, that he received the money that was invested for the trust, not the money that Hetty invested, because that, of course, did so much better than the trust, which was why she was suing the trust. I would like to just add that uh, you mentioned that uh, the family was supporters of Lincoln. And today's Lincoln's birthday. <laughs> yes, my husband and I had the wonderful pleasure of reading your very exciting book. Uh, could you comment on her unusual marriage uh, relationship between she and her husband? Well, they did separate after yes. he after he. Uh, gambled her money away or used it as collateral. But then I think with the encouragement of her children, but also the fact that they were they were still friends, you know, even right after that, um, they remained friends and they would sometimes live in the same places, not in the same apartment, but next door to each other or above one another. Uh, and so they, they maintained a relationship all their life. And when he became ill, he was, um, older than she. But when he became ill, she was by his bedside up in Vermont, which, which, which is where he came from, where they had a house. Um, and so uh, she did care about him. But she was never <coughs> going to have that, you know, the kind of relationship with him that, that they did before. Yes. What was the extent of financial education at the time? I mean, no, there were no CPAs, I assume or degrees in, in finance. Um, I don't know how old the business school, the earliest business school dates. I don't know, but there were no taxes. But certainly either. not for women. Hmm? There were no taxes either. There were no, no taxes, taxes either. either. Not until 1916 when she found it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was the upshot of the lawsuit? I assume she lost it. it no, no, it, no. You know, it, it, it was dismissed on a you know, technicality. Yeah. That um, because the aunt couldn't testify for herself because she was dead, that mm -hmm. Hetty couldn't testify on her own behalf. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but it took years. And then Hetty was constantly suing the the, uh, the trust 
trustees to know of it. Of the, of the trust to know of it. <laughs> <laughs> she won something, lost something. Yes, as part of her, her research, did she ever go outside of New York? You know, out to the railroads, out west. Oh yes, you see the. Oh, areas. very much, very much. What was and the question? Did, besides doing her research in New York, did she ever go out to the railroads? Yes. Um, and her husband was very involved with the railroads, and they would travel on them. And she was, she was very involved with that. Yes. And she traveled all over the country, checking on her, on her property. She had <laughs> huge investments in Chicago. She owned big blocks of property that later became. Downtown, downtown in Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, the Loop. So, so she spent a lot of time doing that. Yes. Yes. Do people like her? <laughs> <laughs> well, some people do, and as Mark said, some people admire her, and some people find her amusing and funny, and other people find her not such a nice person, uh, not not so loving towards her daughter. Um, uh, but you know, she was she was interesting, and I think everybody will say that and, and, and admire her for her shrewd investing and her for you know belief in being able to do that, and for the her interest in young women and um, wanting to make sure that women had a better education, some education in business. Was she the you know, most likable girl on the block? <laughs> but interesting. Yes. Was she the only woman at that time who was doing that, or were there others who were all She was really the only serious investor. Yeah. yeah. There was nobody. Nobody. There were women who were who were buying and selling stocks, uh, you know, with their with their pocket money. Uh, but nobody was an investor. Yeah. Was the Quaker philosophy less closely followed at the death of the daughter? Who, who I think indicated gave a lot of uh, The question is about her the, the Quaker faith and how much she followed it. Uh, yes, but every once in a while she would go to the meeting house on 15th Street and 2nd Avenue. So she wasn't, and you know, she didn't. She wasn't. A, she didn't go weekly, but she. There was a part of her that was always Quaker. Her family that lived in New York mostly became Episcopalian. Um, and her, actually her husband, Hetty's husband was Episcopalian, and just before, uh, just before she died, she became Episcopalian so that she could be buried beside him in the church cemetery of the Yes. Now you said that there weren't any diaries. What um, materials did you research? What were your primary sources? I read a lot of newspapers. And she was written about constantly, um, almost weekly. And not just one newspaper, but all the papers in New York, all the papers in Chicago, papers in Massachusetts, papers around the world. And I also read the uh, memoirs and diaries and books written by people who were her contemporaries and who worked with her or who knew her. Maybe I missed it, but Hetty is usually a nickname. Was that her proper name? Yeah, that was her name. Yeah. 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 So the family's original uh, fortune was in the whaling industry. Yes. When did that industry peak? And start to head downhill as oil was discovered. It was in the in the I'm trying to remember when her father moved to New York. He moved to New York, I think, in 1861, and sold the business. He sold the business and went into merchant shipping in New York, which was always merchant shipping was a part, of course, of the whaling business. Uh, and the family had interests here. And then he became hugely prosperous here. Yes. Um, any interesting anecdotes or events that you came upon that have to do with her 
um, trading on the exchanges? Did she trade on the New York as well as Chicago exchanges? Well, she was more, she didn't buy stock, she bought bonds. So it was, um, and she, you know, so it, it was that. Um, but when she came back to New York in 1873, the story in, in the papers were that people heard that Hetty Green was buying and things started going up. <laughs> <laughs> she had an influence on the market. Thank you so much. Life magazine uh, after Sylvia Wilkes died, so feel free to come up and have a look at it. There's a couple of very interesting photos in it. And as well, in the library's archives, because we were a recipient of the Wilkes estate, we actually have a copy of both the will and the 1953 documents. So if any of you are particularly interested in it, like Dr. Levine, uh, please come and have a glance at that as well. Uh, books are for sale outside, and we'll do the signing at the front. Thank you for coming. Thank <laughs> you.